We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay away! So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Terror Train on October 3rd, 1980. It was written by T.Y. Drake with uncredited screenplay work from Judith Rasko, based on an uncredited story by Daniel Grodnick, directed by Roger Spottiswood, and released by 20th Century Fox. The film was produced by Sandy Howard and Harold Greenberg, producers of Death Ship earlier this year. So I'm guessing they liked the title, Death Ship and Terror Train. It's a good double. Yeah, makes sense. As was the case with Death Ship, this was produced under a Canadian tax shelter. The idea for Terror Train came from a dream that producer Daniel Grodnick had. One weekend night, after watching a double feature of Halloween and Silver Streak, he woke up and said to his wife, What do you think about putting Halloween on a train? His wife answered, that's terrible. He jotted down terrible train on a piece of paper on his nightstand. It kind of reminds me of when Doug from that show woke up from his think big dream and he just wrote big suits on a piece of paper like it was a brilliant idea. I'm sorry, what show are we talking about? Doug. Oh, Doug from Doug. Yeah. (laughs) Doug from that show. He watched a whole music video where they were wearing oversized (laughs) suits and then he just wakes up and writes big suits on a piece of paper (laughs) like that was the essence of the whole dream but wait so his wife was like what if we did halloween on a train he said what if oh he said what if we did halloween on a train but it's new year's well (laughs) halloween the movie (laughs) oh okay (laughs) not halloween the holiday (laughs) yeah but he jotted down terrible train on a piece of paper on his nightstand in the morning he changed the title to terror train wrote up 22 pages of outline and made a deal on it with Sandy Howard's company at 3 o'clock in the afternoon that day. What? Yeah, they didn't put a lot of <laughs> There's forethought There's not a lot it. of forethought into this. Yeah. <laughs> As with our earlier Jamie Lee Curtis film, The Fog, the opening prologue of the college bonfire was the very last scene of the movie to be filmed. It was added during post-production around one month after principal filming ended as a tie-in to the origins of the Kenny Hampson character. So that part was not going to be in the movie. The the whole from the campfire to the spinning around in the blankets was not going to be in the movie. So there was no origin story at all? There was a different origin story at one point, but then they cut that from the script and they weren't going to have anything and just have the people kind of vaguely mention a kid that was was traumatized at a party that doesn't make sense no it doesn't well i guess that's why they fixed it but like you these kinds of movies sort of require you to start with an origin story that's true although we don't see the origin of like jason Voorhees until the very end of that movie yeah but we get i I mean we get hints of it along the way yeah i think that 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 is oh i heard a kid drown here Right, at least we have the origin story Which revealed you get at that, the end. You get that in this. It sounds like there wasn't a reveal at the right, end of this true. for an origin story either. But like in Prom Night, we definitely get that set up. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, that's just a classic horror trope that we have to do. I mean, even in like To, to All Good Night, right. we, you know, we had that. and Yeah, this movie is not worth reinventing the wheel on. Just do mm-hmm. it the way everyone else did it. But it kind of makes sense because I can now, rethinking a bit, I can see how the train pulling up to the station would have been makes the a better en- entrance yeah yeah that yeah. does feel like the start of the movie this was the first directorial effort for roger spottiswood who previously had worked as an editor for sam peckinpah he was hired for the film on the condition that he also edit which i would expect a director to want to do anyway for his own movie especially his directorial debut the magician character was added to the script later on account of producer sandy howard's fondness for magic <laughs> He was just like, I really like magic. Can we put magic on here? How about a giant spider? Yeah. Well, so that's, so I'm just, (laughs) I'm just curious what the script was like before. If we didn't have an origin story or a magician, it was just like people are just dying on a train. This was a commercial for horror. (laughs) It was not long enough to be a movie. 
This film began production two months after Prom Night started in Toronto, so Jamie Lee Curtis rolled directly over to this film in Montreal. Prom Night director Paul Lynch was offered to direct this film as well, but turned it down. To simulate the motion of the train, groups of crew members were enlisted to physically rock the train from the outside during filming. Oh, that sounds like a terrible job. Yeah, <laughs> and also not super useful, it turns out, to the movie. That they're, it's kind of distracting that people are rocking back and forth the whole way through it in the middle yeah. of some of the more serious scenes. The film's budget was $3.5 million, but five was spent on advertising. And when it didn't pay for itself, Fox decided Terror Train would be its first and last slasher film during the peak of the genre's popularity. Oh, that was probably also not a good move. Yeah. This film marks the feature film debut and final appearance of magician david copperfield as a <laughs> fictional character spoiled him on the on the idea mm -hmm. of being in films yeah though he's only credited as magician so he kind of is playing himself here terror train has been repeatedly described as a remake of 1932's 13 women considered by some the first film in the slasher genre starring irene dunn myrna loy whose final film sydney lamette's just tell me what you want kicked off this podcast and peg entwistle who is tragically best known for having committed suicide by jumping off the Hollywood Land sign a month before the premiere of 13 Women, her first and only feature film. Technically, earlier slasher films may have included 1912's The Lunatics, 1926's The Bat, or the Old Dark House films, The Cat and the Canary and The Old Dark House. Looking into it, though, Terror Train and 13 Women are extremely different, and I'm not convinced that Terror Train drew any inspiration from it. Myrna Loy plays a half-Javanese Eurasian woman, snubbed at school by classmates on account of her mixed-race heritage, who decides to track down the women and kill them one by one. Only the climax of the film takes place on a train, but we'll come back to that later. I remember in going over Myrna Loy's early credits for Just Tell Me What You Want, Richard mentioned multiple appearances as Slave Girl. Mm -hmm. And for some reason she moved on from there to play various other races until after 13 women, mostly Asian, though her father was Welsh and her mother was Scottish and Swedish, so there's really no explanation for any of that. Huh. Terror Train was briefly intended to be remade in 2008, but evolved into an original film called Train, starring Thora Birch, and it basically ended up an NC-17 torture porn type movie. We start with the 20th Century Fox logo with a crooked zero. Yeah, so the crooked zero, for some reason, this is the first time I've noticed it. I've never mm. noticed it until you and, pointed it out. And I pointed out. it out to you, and then I then I did a little research on it, and apparently they used this from like 1953 to 1981, and I'm like, how have I never noticed that the Fox logo had a crooked zero for so many of these films? And before that, it had a straight zero, but it was when they switched to anamorphic, you said, or something like yeah, the, when they it, went widescreen they, with it, they the logo changed, changed some sort of uh, yeah, they changed some sort of aspect ratio, and they're like, I know, we'll compensate by tilting the O, and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I don't get it. It it looks weird though. Considering it hasn't looked like that for most of, you know, the rest of, I mean, all of my life in terms of new movies. Well, yeah, because, you know, after 81, it, it goes back to being normal again. Yeah. We open on a bonfire in the middle of a crowded party in the snow. A large banner reads Sigma Phi Omega, Happy New Year. And it, the banner is then draped over the fire and quickly engulfed to riotous applause. Why would they want to burn their own flag? I don't know. It is their... It is their frat, though, that's on there. And, and this, I mean, it feels like an initiation because they're all wearing those, like, beanies. Yeah. So it's, you know, maybe that's a tradition, but I don't understand why. It seems disrespectful to burn your sigil. Yeah. yeah. And would this really be an initiation this far into... This was freshman year. But but it's... But it's it, months yeah, into it's the true. school it's, year. Yeah. yeah. Because it's supposed to be New Year's. Well, I think that they, I think they have until the end of the first semester to lose their virginity. Actually, let let's. So it's not new. Is it New Year's? No, it is New yes. Year's. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was gonna say because the rest of the story takes place on New Year's, but years later. Yeah. So, but yeah, but we're months into the school year, so yeah. it's weird to be initiating people. The tagline for the film was "The boys and girls of Sigma Phi. Some will live and some will die." But uh, is Sigma Phi is just the fraternity, right? Uh, I mean, do fraternities and sororities share letters? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because um, like the Trilams in but, Revenge of the Nerds but these have are the Omega the, Moves where the girls. Right. These are the girlfriends of the of the fret guys. Yeah, it just seems weird to say the boys and girls of Sigma Phi yeah. if it's a fraternity. Yeah. Uh, 
but a group of guys are hassling their quiet friend Kenny about his interest in a girl named Elena, but spelt Alana in the credits. Like A-L-A-N-A, but they call her Elena the whole time. This is the Jamie Lee Curtis character, and she's standing across the party kind of eyeballing him from there. It looks like it's a one-way crush at the moment, but the jock guy acts like they're already in a relationship together. Will you tell me what she sees in you, please? All the dialogue we hear sounds very badly ADR'd here. Well, I'm sure it is, because they're shooting outside by yeah. the fire. You know, they, they overdubbed all that. Yeah. They rush the quiet guy toward Elena for some reason. All the guys in the crowd are wearing these dumb propeller beanies, but without the propeller part. <laughs> and, and evidently, they have to keep them on until they get laid. Late, sir? Me, sir? So just a beanie? Right. <laughs> it was a beanie, but they look like they, they have, have, like, the pinwheel pattern on the well yeah they have like alternating colors in the quadrants but they also have these funny little poof balls lining the outside of it yeah Mm -hmm. it just looks i think it's supposed to look as ridiculous as possible Oh, i'm sure but doc the jockiest guy of the bunch goes to shake hands with the quiet guy kenny but in place of his own hand he holds out the hand of a rotting corpse which his friend grabs without looking and then freaks out he's like (laughs) is that real the pope catholic what you're gonna do when we get to med school because he in his line of work or study has access to body parts and he yeah, likes to I play think a lot of these them. guys are supposed to be pre-med i think they're all pre-med but they're also gross and that's why we're gonna get into a premeditated murder ah, that really should have been the tagline <laughs> premeditated <laughs> Upstairs in a nearby house, Elena and her friend Mitchie are looking down on the party from above. Elena already regrets whatever they have planned. She looks into a bedroom and asks Mitchie, who is that? I don't know, some friend of Doc's. Kenny's friends pester him up the stairs of the house towards Mitchie and Elena. He stops to look at Elena through the railing of the stairs as he comes up and follows her into a bedroom. Mitchie waves him along from another doorway encouraging him to follow her and, and we're in a room full of like flashing lights yeah. which i'm assuming are street lights and signals that, that they've, they've stolen, stolen. yeah, yeah yes. over the years uh in the room elena runs quickly past a bunch of hanging blankets of this giant canopy bed and she hides behind a shape on the bed that looks like a dummy it doesn't it doesn't even look like a human being mm-hmm. shape yeah because it's kind of sat up and hunched forward right and she's hiding by some candles against the far wall behind it. So when Kenny enters and calls out to her, she answers from behind this shape, and it's not at all a convincing pose. Uh, He closes the door behind him, and he begins stripping down, and Elena laughs from behind the curtains and says, Don't be shy. This is my first time, too. Kenny moves in to kiss the shape in bed when it suddenly tips back, and we see that it's not just a friend of Doc's, but rather another corpse or maybe the same corpse because it seems like it's in multiple parts uh but yeah there's a there's a dead woman in this bed and kenny starts freaking out and he stands up on the bed and he's spinning and screaming and twisting himself up in the hanging blankets of this bed (laughs) when a bunch of other guys from the frat come in to laugh at him elena is confused by this reaction And so when she moves around the bed, she sees that it's a corpse and is similarly freaked out because this is not what she signed on for. She thought it was just going to be a harmless, like, oh, it's a guy in the bed, ha ha ha. But it's like, oh no, there's a dead person in the bed. Now, maybe I was making this up in my brain, but was there a ceiling fan also involved? I thought he was caught in the ceiling fan. No, he's just spinning. Okay. I, I, I thought that the blankets were caught in the ceiling fan when he stood up and that's what was causing the spinning, but he's just doing he's that. He's just spinning on his yeah. own, yeah. Oh, okay. So the the only trauma here was the seeing a dead body when you were right. expecting to have sex. Although it did look like he was about to hang himself from this bed. And that's what I thought was happening. Like, when... Because it, it, it weirdly, his scream kind of just goes into a, like a... Like yeah, a weird... and then we freeze frame on him. Well, and yeah. that's why I thought there was a fan involved, because I'm like, I'm waiting for the fan to start taking up these blankets and, and, and hang the guy to, mm-hmm. you know, cause more havoc. Yeah, no fan. We cut to a later date. This is three years later, as a door is slowly opening to reveal a train rolling out of a station at night. A group of college kids in ridiculous costumes get off a bus near a sign advertising steam train excursions exiting the bus elena's boyfriend mo covers her eyes for the big reveal and implies this is his gift to her for graduating early because 
she's going to be finishing up already to transfer to another program somewhere, but she's leaving the school. As they climb off the bus, another student says, I, I like to propose a toast. And a guy in a Groucho Marx costume says, Ridiculous, that's not toast, my good man. Which is an obnoxiously bad joke, even if the guy had said, I'd like to raise a toast. But since he said, I'd like to propose a toast, it just doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> a train pulls up in front of a cheering crowd. Some seem dangerously close to the tracks here. Yeah, yeah that was really concerning to me. The bus driver helping them unload their luggage finds a plastic human skeleton and assumes that they are medical students. One of them offers him a parting joint, and when he flips open the tin, he reveals what looks like a severed finger inside until it starts moving, and we realize it's the kid's finger pushed through a hole in the tin. But why wasn't this just a severed finger? They have severed fingers. Right. They have a we, whole corpse. We've already established that we're willing to just put body parts anywhere we want. Yeah. Uh, the engineer and head porter lean out of the train to laugh at the raucous crowd. Hey, look at this. My goodness gracious. I feel like they would both be just sitting there like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be mopping vomit out of this train for a week. <laughs> and then toward the back of the train, the conductor helps a magician load his equipment on board. From the outside of the train, we can see that two of the cars are labeled Rasco's Folly, a reference to uncredited screenwriter Judith Rasco, and Wickman's Wake, a reference to dialogue director Carol Wickman, though I'm not clear on what a dialogue director is. I know. I is. tried to figure this mm-hmm. out because I, I paused on the screen at the beginning of the film when we're, we're getting the, the It's a very at the early top. credit. I... I tried to look for other dialogue directors, and, and I couldn't find it. And I, obviously, I, I was assuming that it was dialogue editor, that maybe like this was what we called a dialogue editor before we called it a dialogue editor, but I couldn't really find any evidence of that. Yeah. Um, but, but it's like, it's literally the fourth name or something in the opening credits. Yeah, I'm like, even if it was a dialogue editor, you don't get top billing for that. Yeah. So I feel like it's more than that. Yeah, it's very strange. Uh, The woman in the office attached to this train station, Maggie, uh, says that they may have some weather, but that an earlier train said the track was clear as recently as 6 o'clock. The conductor says he wishes that the train had a radio in case of emergencies. (laughs) And this is uh, a little bit of uh, foreshadowing. You're never going to believe what happens. Things (laughs) go a a bit wrong. (laughs) His concerns have apparently fallen on deaf ears until now. Because radios are really expensive? Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure as long as radios have existed, they have been on trains. The conductor and Maggie dance for a moment to the music on the radio in this room. Maggie's in a wheelchair, so she's just kind of rolling back and forth with him. The conductor yells all aboard finally, and the kids climb onto the train. Somebody points out Groucho, stumbling alongside the train with a sword stabbed through his belly, and everyone seems to think it's a hilarious joke. As they close up the train, someone removes Ed's Groucho costume and then rolls him onto the tracks under the train. The train pulls away and we see it smash Ed's hat and arm before cutting away. The sword that he was stabbed with, by the way, very closely resembled the ones being used with the magic equipment, which we saw a bunch of them stabbed into a box as they were loading it into the train car. It probably was one of them. Yes, because although Jamie Lee Curtis is wearing a pirate costume, she did not have an actual sword with her Mm -hmm. elena and mitchie compare their quarters on the train a young girl in a bunny costume congratulates elena for graduating early and suspects that maybe she could be mitchie's new roommate i think this the bunny costume girl is the cutest girl in the whole movie she's adorable and she just seems totally confused about what's going on and it's (laughs) hilarious a girl named pet moves through the train looking for her date ed but she obviously doesn't have any luck because ed's been crushed by a train We dip into a complete non-story of a B story. The conductor asks the engineer how things are going, and he says, Well, this engine is a thing of beauty. They sure don't make them like they used to. Thank God for little favors. The engineer then makes a bold prediction. (laughs) You're going to see a train on the cover of Time Magazine one of these days, and I'm going to be in that cab in the picture. What is he even talking about? (laughs) Does he expect trains to suddenly get more interesting soon? After hundreds of years of use, they will just suddenly become mind-blowing again and get on the cover of Time magazine. Turns out the two of them have an ongoing disagreement because for no reason the conductor in his spare time is also an RV salesman. No, I think he's a conductor in his spare time. In his full-time job, he's an RV Mm -hmm. salesman. (laughs) Either way, they trade barbs arguing over the superior form of travel, even though RVs cannot possibly factor into the plot moving forward. But I just love that they feel like us as an audience are concerned, like, how is he making a living as a train conductor? He yeah. must have something on, you know, else yeah. that he does. 
and I like it's not obviously not a full time job. <laughs> I, I also like his argument of when was the last time you saw a train station next to a shopping mall? Yeah, like, none of it makes sense. When what? was the last time I saw an RV next to? It? Yeah, like, like what does that have to do with your argument? Yeah, it does. None of it makes sense. Well, and little do they know nowadays, trains still in use, shopping malls not so. Yeah, much. they're going away. <laughs> uh, the conductor starts listing advantages of RVs. You can cook. You can take a shower, you can watch TV, and by God, you can hang a left if you feel like it. But all of these things are also possible on a train, so he's really just embarrassing himself. Well, I mean, I think he means randomly hang a left, which you yeah, can't you do Yeah, you can't do train. that. You can't do that in an RV either. You can't be on the freeway <laughs> and just hang a left. <laughs> there has to be a turn. If there's not a turn, you can't go okay. left. Touche. <laughs> but uh, we cut to the POV of the magician peeking through curtains at the crowd in in advance of his show. He's already criticizing them because he doesn't think anyone here looks like they'll pay attention. A group of guys march into the host lounge, which is like the VIP room that they paid extra for. Um, They bring in a bunch of beer and other alcohol, but two of them are immediately shooed out for not being seniors. The jockey guy, Doc, hands out bottles of liquor and wishes the seniors a happy hog night. Jackson says that's what they used to call this night back when they had the bonfires and the pledges had to get laid. A couple of the newer guys mention a tragedy that they've only heard about secondhand that happened sometime in the past and that all the responsible guys were kicked out of the school. And then... Like, it was three years ago, yeah. right? Like, it yeah. wasn't that long ago. Yeah, and if you're all seniors, <laughs> weren't you all in the same class at the time? I guess it's possible these guys just transferred. Well, I think... Uh some of them were still i think that he he tells the freshmen to get out and they I, do but i think that there are still some lower classmen well he said seniors only though so it should have only been seniors in the room that's true um but then doc says almost kicked out like no nah, we're still around um elena's boyfriend mo tries to explain what happened and that it was supposed to be a simple joke that got out of hand but doc wants to tell the whole story you want to know what really happened doc yeah, please yeah. Drop. we were freshmen we were only freshmen and then he starts singing a, what is that verb, the verb, pipe? verb pipe i always get the verb and verb pipe mix up it's one of those two yeah <laughs> it's like i used to the hive white stripes strokes and vines i used to mix up that's that is totally understandable he launches into the whole story about how they pranked a kid with a cadaver but while he's talking elena enters the room and when she hears him talking about it she's immediately pissed off she cuts to the end of the story by shouting that the pranky was hospitalized and she tries to cut the tension by blowing a noisemaker in doc's face and then they rush the new pledges out of the car and break out champagne to share see that that's why i think that they're i think they're seniors but they're new pledges okay they're new to the fraternity can you pledge as a senior that seems like you're kind of cheating (laughs) at the beginning it seemed like somehow they were already seniors when they were freshmen and that they were picking on the new pledges and it's mm-hmm. like aren't we all pledges didn't, didn't this fraternity start today yeah <laughs> we cut to the engine room where another engineer starts poking fun at the conductor's rv business and asks how that's going the conductor says not good i should have gotten out of it 10 years ago not five <laughs> so now for no foreseeable reason we've set up that the conductor in his spare time until around five years ago was an rv salesman and that he has a lot of inventory well no he's still an rv salesman but he says he should have gotten out of it 10 years ago instead of five years ago. Oh, okay. So he isn't an RV salesman. He's not actively buying them to sell. <laughs> he just has random RVs. He just you has a buy pile an RV? of RVs. It's like he's got a trench coat and he walks up to people on the street like, you want an RV? <laughs> okay, he's just got all the keys. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they thought that they had to give Ben Johnson something to do since he's the biggest name in the cast after Jamie Lee Curtis. But maybe they could have just hired nobody and written a B story for other college students. Well, well, there isn't really a B story here. I mean, you're pretending like this is a B story, but it never... It's just a thing that keeps it's a co- happening. It's like, it's a handful of lines, and that's it's it. It's where a B story would be in a movie. B. B. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, they keep trying to add to Ben Johnson's character. Like, he does, like, magic later on. Yeah. And he implies that he is uh, a magician of sorts, <laughs> because, like, he says he's sworn to secrecy about how right. how the magician is doing his tricks. So I was like, so is he magician? I thought there was going to be some really great payoff later, like yeah. when he does some kind of sleight of hand with the killer. Uh, oh, that would have been great. Does a trick or something like that. And I was like, he I'm magically for that. sells you an RV. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can't you picture like, yourself? Check your pocket. <laughs> keys. Um, but yeah, I think they just, they got Academy Award winner Ben Johnson and they were like, we got to give him something to do. But everywhere I read said that Ben Johnson pulled the director aside and said, I learned a lesson from John Ford and I want to convey it to you. Give me fewer lines because I think I can do more with them. So they actively went through the script and took lines out for this character. I can't imagine what they took out <laughs> if this is what they left in. Like, well, did he? does he just have a whole monologue about RVs in the middle of it? Like it's Glengarry Glenn Ross? A, a scene of him just beating the crap out of shovels for about... Like, yeah, for I'm no John, reason. Your trains aren't going to go anywhere. I mean, maybe this was the B story and it just didn't doesn't feel like it now because they did take out all the lines. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't know. Weird story. <laughs> maybe they. Maybe the, the at the end of the movie, there's the train was supposed to be like, oh no, the brakes are out, and they had to park like twelve RVs on the tracks. Yeah, which you can only do with RVs. We'll be like used cars where we just bring in a bunch of college kids yeah. to drive mm-hmm. a bunch of RVs out of here. Garrett Graham's just trying to race the last car onto the track to stop the train. <laughs> to return to his point about RVs being better than trains, he asks the train enthusiast engineer, "When's the last time anyone built a shopping mall next to a train yeah. station?" To which I would reply, "Are malls notoriously not built next to train stations?" Followed by, "Are malls typically built next to RV parks?" And then, "What relevance does this have to literally anything?" <laughs> Instead, the guy just smiles as if surrendering a point to the conductor. Mitchie moves through the train and is surprised by Groucho in one of the rooms off the hall, even though he doesn't say anything. He just startles her by being there. And he's like pantomiming Groucho Marx, like ashing the cigar and stuff. He offers her a joint from the prank tin, but this time it has an actual severed finger in it rolling around. He follows her down the hall. But also joints, which it didn't have before. It, it, it had it, joints it had before, joints before. Did it? but but yeah. it's weird because oh. so he he opens the thing and it's got the finger in it and it's got like six joints in it and then when we go to the insert there's just one joint that she's taking out and now it's empty but but for the finger oh okay because so. i was gonna say i don't remember seeing the extra joints in it and yeah and i was like that sucks for the conductor to not actually get a joint out of this well no there joke. were definitely joints it wasn't the conductor it was, it was the, the it was the bus driver or the bus driver but I'm sorry there were joints in it but he just didn't take one because i think at that point he was like all right fuck you guys like i don't even know what these are then if you're just gonna <laughs> prank me like this well if you think this is funny i want one of these yeah, i'm not gonna that's smoke stupid, like and i need to be shit high. that you rolled <laughs> Groucho follows Mitchie down the hall while she strings him along about a girl that might like him. But then the girl she's talking about is named Pet, she says, which I'm pretty sure was already Ed's girlfriend. So it's like, oh, I got a girl for you. Like she's going to lead him to his own girlfriend. And she suddenly throws open the curtains of a sleeper shelf to surprise a girl for no reason as she's moving down the hall. And we hear like a shout plugged in to the moment, but the we see like legs of a person and they don't move at all. So I don't think that this person actually reacted to the curtain being opened. I also don't know why this person's asleep one hour into the party. Groucho sounds starts like me. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like me. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, a train full of drunk people. Yeah, I'm just going to. I forget why I did this. <laughs> I just really needed to get from the station back to the station today. I don't know where they're going. I think it's just a loop, <laughs> right? Uh, I've actually done a costumed train excursion. Uh, have you <laughs> really? And he just slept <laughs> immediately. <laughs> no, no, it was a, it was like a whole dinner theater who done it, but everyone else, everyone had to wear costumes and stuff. And does it take you back to the original place you started from? Yes, it went from like Fillmore to like Santa Clara and back. I think. Okay. Uh, just like on the those trains, like because logistically, if you don't end up where your car is, I mean, I guess well, the that's bus what the bus is met, for. Met them at the other end. Yeah, the bus picked them up at the parking lot and then drove them to that's the other fair. side of the tracks. Groucho starts to shove Mitchie into a room when Jackson shows up in a lizard costume. He looks like a slee stack. <laughs> and, <laughs> I was uh, thinking that same thing. <laughs> and Jackson tells Groucho that prank with the sword earlier that was really incredible. And then he offers Groucho a drink in the bathroom stall. I can't get a handle on this Jackson character. Either the actor is just flat out terrible or all of his dialogue is getting ADR'd hardcore because it just sounds wrong. Like every word that comes out of his mouth sounds incorrect. It it, it, it feels like the line reads of a movie in the director's second or third language. But he says, Hey, Ed, that number at the station? <laughs> With the sword? Better than Doc could have done. Super fantastic, man. <laughs> <laughs> Groucho grabs Jackson's head and then pulls his mask off to reveal himself before smashing Jackson's head through the bathroom mirror. Back in the host lounge, Elena and Mo, wearing a parrot costume, are getting very cuddly. 
She compliments his idea of having this train party and tells Mitchy she might have to marry this guy for being so thoughtful. But then Doc pipes up, marry me, it was my idea. Elena gets pissed off and stands to leave, but then Doc jokes, you're always walking out of my parties, but this time you can't. As he leaves the host lounge, Mo threatens Doc, but for no reason, while doing an impression of a parrot, undercutting <laughs> the seriousness of his accusation. <laughs> Rock, I'll get you for this one, Doc. I mean it this time. He apologizes just outside the lounge, and she forgives him, but suddenly she smells a spilled drink and thinks they're going to get in trouble with the train company. She smells it from inside the bathroom, I think. Or out just outside the door. They're waiting They're waiting by the bathroom door. Yeah. There's a hint that Doc may have done something to somebody, some of the alcohol. Yeah. But it he, never plays a factor. He just says like, oh yeah, guess what I put in this? And he shakes one of the liquor bottles like, I put something in here mm-hmm. to spike it for everybody. But, uh, but it's do you, alcohol. Do you need to spike alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> a little opium just to, yeah. you know cut that edge it's, it's got to be either acid <laughs> or just poison he's like i literally kill everybody they move to the bar car where the magician is just beginning a close-up show he borrows a coin from elena just as she approaches a coin operated peanut dispenser in the corner and then pushes a volunteer's cigarette through the center of the coin what she pushes a volunteer cigarette a volunteer's <laughs> cigarette oh Or a volunteered (laughs) cigarette. The cigarette itself was volunteered. (laughs) And then pushes a volunteered cigarette. Does that make more sense than volunteers cigarette? I didn't hear the S, so it was like the cigarette was like, (laughs) Me! 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 (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's see how to reword this. And then pushes a cigarette. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, just say cigarette. And then pushes a borrowed cigarette. (laughs) Fuck you. I'm trying to record this stupid episode. (laughs) And then pushes a borrowed cigarette through the center of the coin. He smokes it while it's stabbed through the coin and then pulls it back out. This trick typically relies on a trick coin, but most of the audience is behind the coin from the camera, so they should all plainly see how this trick works. They're just pretending not to for our benefit. Is it, do you, can you, with the tricked coin, can you see the hole on the opposite side? Well, the way the the trick works is you're pushing the cigarette through a hole in the center of the coin and the back oh, of the it's coin got is like a fold, flap. it folds open. Yeah. Oh, okay. But when you, we see in super close up him pulling the cigarette out, that shot is actually played in reverse so that it's harder to tell what's happening. Ah. But, uh, but really the center part of that coin just pops out on the other side. When the trick is over, Elena asks, what about my peanuts? Which he should have just been like, here's your stupid coin back. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat it. Um, But instead, with a wave of his magic hands, the dispenser drops a handful of peanuts for her. How'd they do that magic trick? Uh, String, I think. (laughs) Uh, Ed and Jackson's girlfriends complain to each other about their missing boyfriends. Pet thinks that Ed just flat out missed the train, pretending to be stabbed. Mo notices that Elena is upset again, and he tries to apologize, but she says, it's not that. You let him set you up again. She starts to pick on his fraternity, and he immediately jumps to its defense like an idiot who cares more about his fraternity than his girlfriend. Mo suggests that Elena is just mad because Doc tricked her into traumatizing someone with a human corpse. I guess you don't subscribe to bros before hoes. No. (laughs) Uh, I I appreciate that, sweetie. (laughs) it's also obnoxious though like they're setting this guy up it's like there's clearly an obvious thing that he's supposed to be saying here and then he's like well hold on don't you dare make fun of my the abstract noun that is my fraternity (laughs) it's like uh i'm mad right now your fraternity's not mad at you this movie really wants us to hate mo the conductor stops doc and mitchy to show them a magic trick but it's a joke trick where the card he shows them wasn't their card in the first place now what what was your card (laughs) jack of hearts Not only has it risen to the top of the deck, but now it has become the Jack of Spades. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It kind of reminds me of uh, the Brothers Bloom, where Mark Ruffalo is always doing a a card trick throughout the movie of, think of a card, and he shows them a random card. Is that your card? And everyone always goes, no, it's not it. It's like, eventually. It's like, well, well one day I'm going to do it right. It's going to be the greatest card trick anyone's ever seen. <laughs> so I'm wondering if that's the conductor's plan here. It's like one of these times they're going to say yeah. a card. Damn, I was so close. At least it was Jack's this time. 
but yeah, so far every scene with this conductor is completely useless. Um, it didn't need to be such a huge name actor. Mitchie and Doc start making out next to the locked bathroom door with Jackson's corpse behind it. We cut to a very dramatically staged magic show. Our magician is just making cards appear and disappear, which is even less interesting in a film than it would have been on stage. Elena asks the conductor if he knows how the magician does it. Yeah. How? We're sworn to secrecy. Next, the magician makes his assistant levitate, a trick we last saw in Stardust Memories. Doc finds Mo moping around in the bar car. He asks if Elena's still mad, and Mo says, yeah, I think for good this time. Doc says, don't forget, if she leaves you, you've always got me. But he doesn't say it like it's a joke, so I'm pretty sure that he's actually interested in Mo, mm-hmm. and they they explore that further in the story. I don't I don't know the relevance of that relationship. Well, because uh, someone will say later that uh, him that Doc and Mitchie have an understanding. Oh, okay. And we don't we don't fully delve into what that understanding is, other than that they could probably be with other people. Yeah. And uh, but it, not specifically of what gender or sex. Yeah. The magician drags a hoop around the levitating woman the same way Woody Allen did and then covers her with a scarf to make her disappear. Ed and Jackson's girlfriends come out of the magic show very impressed. Doc and Mo offer to have sex with them in the host lounge, basically. Jackson's girlfriend jokes that they don't have experience and they say that they used to work in an emergency gynecological office. Yeah, that's right. Doc won an award. Best paps in a supporting role. Because they're hilarious. Doc and Mo and the girls try again to get into the locked toilet. Suddenly the conductor is there with a key, threatening to open it because he smells liquor. Weirdly though, the last time we saw this door, it was being unlocked before the killer left, and he could not have locked it behind him. On the floor of the room, we see Jackson's weird lizard man costume drenched in blood. The conductor touches the blood to see if it's real, and I think he's like reaching under the mask to check for a pulse on his neck, but he doesn't take the mask off. No. So he has no idea who's in this costume. Uh, We cut away to a dance in another train car. The magician moves through the car, eyeballing Elena the whole way. We cut back to the staff quarters of the train, and the conductor is just getting a cup of coffee from the kettle like he didn't just find a dead person on the train. His coworker senses he's shaken up and asks, what's wrong? The conductor tells him that he just found a dead boy in the sleeper toilet. You sure he was dead? I've never seen somebody so dead as that. So at all i guess (laughs) he's never seen a dead person in general he asks his co-worker to please watch that car while he calls walter he also reminds his co-worker that nobody else on the train knows so please keep this to yourself but at least one person has to know because this guy didn't die like this magically and then splash his own blood all over the bathroom well i don't think he is drawing conclusions about that because the door was locked when he arrived to it so he might think that this guy was a drunken idiot and managed to kill himself in that or intentionally killed himself maybe so i'm trying to picture now how many cars are on this train the magician's car is the last car because there's at least four yeah because yeah the magician car is the last car and and then there's a a sleeper car a bar car and then there seemed to be at least one the 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 host lounge car uh and at least one other car that had individual compartments because that's yeah, where they put Alana and then, Alana there, and then in. there's also the the car that is like the employee lounge or whatever yeah, and then right. there's the engine yeah I think I get your point though because if he's calling Walter then that would mean that this car wouldn't be right up against the engine which I would think it should be well and and, and that's the thing is like he they go into the engine the the train engine but then they talk about shoveling coal it's like well is there a tinder car that would have all this coal? How are they getting from this car to the engine? It's a steam engine, a coal-powered yeah. steam engine. And we've seen the engineer walk into the other employee area, yeah. like completely coated in coal dust, clearly from having just been working. Right. And so those trains must be, or those cars must be connected to each other. Right. So, so it seems unnecessary to go and pick up the phone and be like, I'm going to call him. And it's like, just go through that door. Yeah, exactly. He's right there. <laughs> The conductor speaks with Walter, and they decide that the fastest way to end this trip is to just move forward to the the station at the end of the line because they're already past the halfway mark. So uh, it would be faster to finish the trip that rather than s- switching it into reverse. So they speed the train up to make a little bit better time. 
The conductor moves to show the brake man the body, but when he opens the door, the lizard costume is now moving on the floor, and the conductor assumes it must have been some kind of a practical joke. Maybe on him, or maybe on somebody else. I'm not clear. But all the blood has been meticulously wiped up, even right. off of the costume. But the mirror is still broken. Right. Right. So in order to make this happen, our killer had to dispose of this body somewhere. Yeah. And do a costume change. The amount of costume changes that must happen in this film in order I mean, there's for a lot of enclosed spaces. You know, th- there could be bodies in all the shelves of the sleeper car. I suppose. I mean, yeah, I guess disposing the body might not be the hardest thing. Wiping up that blood a little bit harder yes, because there was enough of it and blood's and not what the it, easiest what, to And what is the up. benefit of wiping the blood up? Yeah. Like, he already saw it. But also... Just so many costume changes. I just don't understand how this killer has the time to do these costume changes and and could get away with it so secretly. Yeah. Well, and and especially given the surprise at the end yeah. of, that of this person yeah, that's doing all the costume changes. This person is busy the yeah. whole time. <laughs> Are there the, two killers? <gasps> no. No. <laughs> I told you before. Four children committed all the other murders. The brakeman finds an empty bottle of liquor and hands it to the conductor as though this explains why the costume on the floor is no longer covered in blood or wrapped around a dead person. Mitchie sees them helping the lizard costume out of the bathroom and assumes it's Jackson, even though we can tell from the eye holes that this is a white person in the costume right? now. <laughs> uh, she asked I, if he, I thought that was the reason that this particular character had to be in such an all... Like, he's wearing gloves, he's mm-hmm. wearing the full mask. Oh, okay, like, yeah. It's the only, he's the only character of all of the costumes that is, like, 100% covered. And I'm like, oh, we have a person whose skin tone isn't white. Let's cover him completely up. So I feel like he- you'd be sweating your ass off in that costume, too. It's <laughs> all would- rubber. There's 100 people on this train. Nobody would choose to wear that to a party. No. <laughs> Mitchie sees them helping the lizard costume out of the bathroom and assumes it's Jackson. She asks if he's been in there the whole time, pretending he's sick, though the conductor is already fairly certain that he's drunk. Look, here you are, a walking and talking, but he's definitely not talking. Doc, Mo, and their new girlfriends flip through a yearbook in the host lounge until they find a picture of Kenny Hampson. We go back to Mitchie, who is seducing the lizard in the hallway, despite him being the boyfriend of her good friend. Doc and Jackson's girlfriend are moving through the hall looking for their significant others, and Jackson's girlfriend worries aloud that he's cheating on her. Lizard Man starts stroking Mitchie's leg, and she asks if he can manage without the flipper. He takes off the arm of the costume to reveal an African-American arm and he's using it to stroke her breasts when she says, you know what they say, cold hands, warm heart, which I don't Mm -hmm. think that's what they say. Is that that the Friday Night Lights thing? Cold hands, warm heart? I've never heard it, but it could be. (laughs) That's not. Is that a thing people say? It is a thing people say. Okay. Upon Googling. What's the Friday Night Lights thing? I don't know. What you, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never just, seen Friday Night Lights. Just Google Friday Night Lights mantra. Okay. Clear eyes, full hearts. <laughs> okay, that was close. When she opens her eyes, she sees the severed hand sitting there on her breast, and the lizard man grabs her mouth to hold it shut. Back in the bar car, a kid in an Uncle Sam costume is doing his best impression of a southern senator or something. Yeah. And he's just monologuing in a southern drawl yeah, to nobody. Like, nobody's he's listening to him. leg horning it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the magician is watching intently as Elena enters the room, and once she gets close to him, she compliments his show earlier. He asks, do you believe in magic? Which is a question we heard very recently from the loving spoonful <laughs> on stage in the film One Trick Pony. Uh, I love... Uh, her reaction to that jamie lee curtis is like grimace and like shaking her hand like yeah. eh, it's so so <laughs> no not really because it, it's she's just so like charming on screen all the yeah. time yeah and and it's it's it, it remi- also reminded me of like tom hanks in uh what was that he knows you're alone he knows you're alone was just like god this person is just so charming <laughs> I, I, they're gonna go places yeah yeah, yeah. i bet you're right <laughs> she basically says no i don't and he pulls a rose from behind her back to convince her. Doc tells Elena that Mo is waiting for her, and we already know this isn't true because he's trying to get Mo in trouble because he wants Mo all for himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, another another kind of like red herring is that the magician knows Elena's name. 
Oh, that is interesting. Because he says something like, I can show you Elena. And, and, and I was like, oh, how do you know her name, Mr. Magic? There you go. He was Suspicious. hired for a party for her. He should know her but name. But he wasn't hired She's by the people the who paid honor. for this party. They, they, we don't know that. They didn't even know that a magician was included on this train. Or was it? Pet is trying to convince Mo to dance and starts taking off her costume, which we haven't mentioned, by the way, is literally just a pair of pants hiked up past her boobs with suspenders. But there's also a hand coming up out of the pants. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't understand this costume. She's wearing a bow tie. And there's tie. a bow tie. <laughs> what is this costume supposed to be? I think it's be? supposed to be like a clown or like a hobo type character. But I don't know why. Why they're not wearing a shirt and it's just covering her boobs with yeah. pants. I don't get it. The magician does another quick magic show and he picks a fight with Doc when Doc starts making fun of his tricks. The magician drops a switchblade onto a pile of cards he's thrown on the floor. And when he picks up the card the knife stabbed through, it says Doc underneath it. And then he frisbees the card in Doc's face like an awesome badass guy. We get back to the sleeper car, and the conductor finds a shoe on the ground. Suddenly, Mitchie's hand flops out the way dead hands tend to in these movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tucks it back in before noticing her corpse. Her throat is slit, so she's not just drunk like the last body he found. On their way to the back of the train, Elena hears Moe's voice in a cabin and tries to get in for a moment. She says that Doc told her to come find him, but luckily for Moe, the conductor keeps pushing her down the hall away from the sleeper car. He's trying to get her away from the body, I thought to keep her from panicking, but then when he takes her to the back of the train, he just says point blank, Mitchie's dead. Even though he doesn't really know for sure who's dead. Like, he just asked her, hey, do you recognize this shoe? And she's like, yeah, that's my friend Mitchie's shoe. And he's like, Mitchie's dead. Yeah. This <laughs> it's like, must this be could hers. be anybody's shoe. There's a lot of people in this <laughs> a lot train. Of drunk people who could be missing shoes. <laughs> and when she doesn't believe him, he's like, come on, I'll show you. And he drags her back to the body. <laughs> like, look, see, there she is. Dead as a doornail. Now you can panic. Mo manages to sneak away from Pet and not get caught, so that whole scene was kind of pointless. Also, we never see that character again. Pet is just done with the movie. She took off her clothes, and now we just never have to refer to her again. The conductor escorts Elena back to the body when she doesn't believe him, effectively defeating the purpose of ushering her away in the first place. The magician sits in a chair and has, his, and has a volunteer drape a blanket over his head, and then he disappears from under the blanket and then reappears at the back of the magic car. This this trick bothers me. Why? Just because it doesn't actually work? It doesn't make sense because, I mean, I get that there's ways of doing this sort of trick when right. you're in, like, a, sh a show space. Mm -hmm. But a train is not designed. Like, there's no... Yeah, there's no corridor you there's can no sneak through. There's no passages and corridors yeah. and stuff. Like, you can't get through the crowd. So yeah. it's It's very, just a film trick. It's very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's the most impressive <laughs> trick. It's a prestige whole situation. <laughs> Uh, I think the biggest trick is the one that's about to happen, though. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a couple really uh, interesting ones here for the reality of the space. Yeah. Um, Elena and the conductor try to talk through who could have done it, and the conductor settles on the falling down drunk lizard man as a suspect, even though earlier he saw this person dead. <laughs> for his next trick, the magician holds up the blanket again and turns into his assistant. Uh, although... The entire audience is standing behind him right. on the other side of the blanket. Right. <laughs> uh, so they would they would have seen the transmogrification unobstructed. The conductor finds a bloody napkin in the bathroom. Doc realizes that Mo is at best unconscious next to him and at worst dead. Uh, he starts screaming for help reviving his friend, but nobody believes him because he's constantly playing pranks with corpses. So, so I rewound this scene... From when he comes, when Mo comes to talk to Doc, like four or five times, because like I looked away from at my phone for the first time, I was like, "Oh, You're like wait, what happened? Did, what I, did I, miss, I miss? Did I miss the kill?" Yeah. And so I go back and I'm, I'm watching. He's like, "Am I not back far enough?" Because this is when he comes in, and he's got his head down. I was like, "I kept going back and." What is happening? How is he? He's not like a major character, though. He's not the boyfriend of the lead or anything. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> what happens? And then when we see his injury, I was like, when did this happen? Like someone took your shirt off and stabbed you in the chest and then put your shirt back on? Yeah. In this crowded room without anyone seeing it? Doc screams for help reviving his friend, but nobody believes him. By the time he's dragged Mo through the entire train to the conductor, he's totally drenched in blood now. 
Doc insists repeatedly that he is a doctor as he slaps the corpse of his friend. Doc and Elena cradle Moe's corpse when Elena tells Doc that Mitchie is also dead. Doc freaks out and starts yanking on the brake cable, and the conductor braces himself for a sudden stop, but when nothing happens, he worries that something's happened to Walter in the engine room, and that he may be dead too, so he races to the front of the train. When he gets there, the engine compartment is completely empty, and the conductor has to slam on the brakes himself. I'm not clear why. Why does he have to stop the train? He was just worried about someone else trying to stop the train, and then he stops yeah. the train. Everything that they do after this, they don't need to completely empty the train to do it. I, I agree. I mean, I, I really don't have a clear thought, because I understand they're going to do a head count to have everyone take off their masks. You can still clear the train one car at a time mm-hmm. toward the back of the train, which is where they put everybody. Yeah. Um. But, but they stop the train in the snow. I don't understand the concept of, of what you're saying, though, of doing a head count of everybody and everybody taking off their mask because it it doesn't matter. Anybody could be guilty. But it, would, it could prevent future murders. If you have eyes on everybody and you know exactly how many people there are in a room and you put and you lock them all in the same room watching each other. Yeah, no, no, one, no one can conceal their identity. So if someone doesn't belong... If someone was using costumes as yeah, a means of Yeah, but what hiding. if it's just somebody that they know is doing all of this? That doesn't then, help Then us that at all. person can't stab them in a crowded room without a mask on. I guess. But also, props to the conductor to know, to know to, for all his anti-train, he sure knows how to drive the train. Yeah, that's true. How hard could it be, though? <laughs> yeah, it's only a vintage steam engine. <laughs> <laughs> uh they do find a bloody engineer's hat, but no engineer, so presumably these guys were also thrown off of the train somehow. They walk all the kids off the train into the snow in the middle of nowhere and check the train for stragglers. Two train employees find a blow-up doll in the hallway. Outside the train, Elena tells Doc that she tried to visit Kenny Hampson in the hospital shortly after their prank from the cold open and that they wouldn't let her see him. They said that he'd killed someone, but I'm not clear when. If yeah. it was before the prank yeah, or after no, the prank? I think it was after. Like, he was in the hospital because he was crazy? Yeah. Doc presumes that he and Elena are next on his kill list. They've decided this is definitely the work of Kenny. He's out to get us. He's, he's out for revenge for that prank. Yeah. They get back onto the train, and Doc locks them in a private sleeper compartment. He even kicks the handle off the door for some reason, so they can't get out, but someone could potentially get in because there's still a handle on the outside. The conductor tells the crowd that all the kids will have to finish the ride in the same car without masks on so they can keep track of everyone. They're reluctant to reboard the train with a murderer, but he tells them that they're going to freeze to death out here. Yeah, it was like, you can't lock us up all in the car with the killer? It's like, well, he's not going to kill everybody yeah. all together. He doesn't have a machine gun. Yeah. Doc shows Elena a page from the yearbook with Kenny Hampson in the Magic Club. I don't know what's even being implied here because Kenny looks absolutely nothing like the magician Mm -hmm. so it's ridiculous that it seems like the point is literally that this kid that looked totally bizarre in the cold open somehow looks like david copperfield now well uh we did have the man with bogart's face right but then it should there should have been something that happened with that movie like oh you know he he caught on fire or something oh he had to have some kind of facial reconstruction yeah after that stint in the mental institution he also did a stint in the Plastic Burn surgery ward. institution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or or have him be a plastic surgeon where he's crazy enough to do it on himself. That would be a great great twist. Or she said, "I went to go see him, and they said he cut his face off. Mm-hmm. They replaced it with Nicholas Cage's." Elena thinks they should warn their friends about Hampson, and when she gets outside the room, she is startled by the conductor. Doc suddenly decides to check all the storage compartments in this sleeper room <laughs> that he locked a while ago, but all he finds are cat sounds. Like, every time he opens the cabinet, it goes like... (laughs) That's very weird. (laughs) He sits down on the bed and realizes that someone could be under the bed moments too late. And when he tries to get away, someone grabs his leg and he scrambles across the floor until a hand grips his shoulder and we see what looks like a woman's hand with a ring. And he recognizes it right away as Mitchie's ring. Oh, it's a joke. It's a goddamn practical joke. And then his throat gets slit. Although we cut right before his skin is actually broken. So once again, I question the timelines of this movie and how this killer could be in all these places, do all these costume changes, 
and be all you know because he gets this person in, should be in the room with all the other he, kids and, and in order for this guy to have been gotten here he, this person had to be hiding under this bed mm-hmm. when he walked in there and kicked the you know the door closed and and i think this person's not afraid to climb out on the outside of the train on top of it maybe and run all the way to the back of it yeah, but it's just, you'd have to be waiting under this bed. It just happened to be in the right room right. that he's going to be into. Just I don't know. guess. That's a real good luck. Because we also find out that there are other compartments that ha- are not in use. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't been in use for years for some reason. Yeah. Elena rushes to the conductor to tell him that the magician is the killer. And the conductor finds Doc's body in the overhead compartment of his room. And then he finds Doc's head. It just tumbles out, or I guess it's not Doc's head. It's somebody's head. It looks very different than Doc's head. A brakeman, it's supposed to be Doc's head, though, I should specify. It's very clearly not, though. Uh, It's only a model. (laughs) It's only a model. A brakeman offers to stand guard outside the room Elena is resting in, the one that hasn't been open for years. But moments later, we see him stabbed through the chest with a sword, the same kind of sword that Ed was stabbed with before the train started. And this kill bothers me. Because this is the only kill of the whole movie that isn't somebody responsible at the beginning for tormenting Kenny. Mm-hmm. That's true. Well, the only kill that the, we well, see the aftermath of, because the engineers got the killed. The engineers got killed. Oh, I guess they did. No, you're right. All right. Maybe they enough. did. Maybe they didn't get killed. I don't, Maybe we don't, we don't actually see out. what happens to the engineers. Yeah. But we yeah. see this kill. We just see their bloody hat. This person is not responsible for any of this stuff. And yeah. why kill the engineers? I don't know. Uh, to draw attention to yourself the conductor cordons off the magician's area Uh, he chains up the door after he gets the magician's assistant out of the room because he doesn't want her to get hurt the killer sneaks up on elena with an axe but when he swings it down he finds a blow-up doll under the blanket and she pops out to stab him with another sword or maybe the same sword that she took out of the guy yeah uh, yeah i was wondering where she got this sword because we mentioned that she is wearing a pirate costume because yeah. mo is supposed to be a parrot uh i am assuming for her costume yeah benefit uh but yeah she she stabs this killer in the shoulder but then just runs away yeah. <laughs> it's like ha yeah that's, that's, that's how you do it in around? these movies <laughs> uh, i would i would yeah i would stab again while he's <laughs> down that's like in uh, friday the 13th though when they like get mrs Voorhees on the ground and she's like bleeding from the head but clearly still alive and then she's just like now i run now it's i like, run no, she's unconscious finish her the killer follows her bleeding through the train and tackles her hard to the floor at one point and then yanks her earring out of her Ugh. ear yeah. through the skin she locks herself in the conductor's cage and he tries repeatedly to stab at her with a very long iron bar I do like that he is knocking all the lights out because her area is lit and he's taking all the lights out outside yeah. of it so she can't see where he's coming from. And it would have been funny, though, if she took that her. paper spike and just broke the lights above her. You have no idea where I am in this eight <laughs> in this square feet. Cage. <laughs> she picks up a paper spike from the conductor's desk. That's what it's called, a paper spike. I had to look it up. Yeah, what is this I, thing called yeah this uh, palm I, impaler this <laughs> i'm trying to find out what, what where's my note it's like a memo nail that you're just supposed to stab notes onto did this one stab <laughs> i put she stabs him in the face with a note post yeah note post there you go that's good it's called a paper spike first you take this like put it in the bag bump bump uh and she stabs the killer in the eye with it or what appears to be the eye. Later on, we see that it's Oh, it's cheek. just somewhere in the face. Yeah. Facial region. She leaves the cage again for some reason, and they struggle for a moment before she tosses him off the train between cars, and the conductor finds her all bloodied and weak and walks her back through the train before we cut to a pair of bloodied arms gripping a handle on the outside of the train. So, shocker, the killer is not dead yet. Um, just outside and cold. Later, Elena is left alone to rest again, and we see the killer climbing around on the outside of the window. <laughs> it looks very goofy this moment. Uh, is this like a comp shot? Because it's just, yeah, it's very silly the way yeah, I don't know. the face comes in. Elena moves to the magician's quarters and starts rifling through his stuff for some reason. Suddenly, the sword box falls open, and she sees the magician stabbed repeatedly through the box. Oh, I guess he isn't responsible for anything either, and he dies. Yeah turns but. out oh well there's a couple things that happened before this too that are weird 
the conductor finds Alana and she's like resting. And then Mary comes and wakes her up and says, you should come into the other cars with the rest of us. And she goes, okay. But then Mary leaves her alone. And then Alana's or Elena, sorry, is walking back. And then the prez finds her and says, you should come into the other cars with us. I was like, didn't this just happen? Yeah. Why do we have this twice? Why, why do have this twice? But then she's in the magicians. Like, it's like, why do they keep leaving her alone when they keep yeah. asking her to join them? It's very weird. Elena runs through the train to the conductor to tell him that the magician is dead and now she doesn't know who the killer could be. Suddenly the conductor grabs her wrists and she realizes this isn't him. This is the killer in another mask. Kenny has been playing the magician's assistant this entire time. Even when the magician's assistant was in the middle of a show and actively killing people. That's what I'm saying. The timelines and the all the places that he has to be throughout this thing makes no sense. He makes too many costume changes and is in too many places at the same time. Yeah. He tells her basically that he killed everyone and he's demanding a kiss here. And when she obliges, she seems to surprise him. And suddenly he's transported back to that prank from the intro and he stands screaming and spinning again when suddenly the conductor is there with a big shovel and just smacks him in the face real hard. <laughs> and he just falls out a, a open doorway as the train is crossing a bridge. So this body falls hundreds of feet to the icy floor and misses the river by like a foot and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so it just hits this frozen solid block of ice and then rolls into the water. Yeah, it's really great. I, I was so excited for that because I saw him heading towards the water. He's like, oh, he's going to land in the water. And this is going to be like this risk that he's still alive. Yeah. But like, nope. Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's real great and that's the end of our film uh, both this film and 13 women end with the killer being revealed and then thrown from the train to their death in one draft of the story the train breaks down outside a mental asylum where a patient snuck on board and Wait, for 13 women no in, uh, in for this, this movie yeah um, and the original prank before the one that they went back and reshot was going to be that the fraternity guys had uh, tied up two of two nerdy guys together and pushed them out into the middle of a lake naked during a graduation picnic. And then when they tried to get out of the boat, one of the two guys drowned. So it's the other guy avenging okay. his dead okay. friend. So there was always a backstory that motivated the killing. Right. Okay. That makes more sense. And And that backstory would work just as well with what they say in the host lounge as what we saw happen yeah um so the script likely didn't change until after they had shot the movie mm -hmm. and then they went back and shot the whole corpse prank thing um yeah there's a lot to this movie that is unnecessary it's very confusing there's too many people on this train mm -hmm. it's like if friday the 13th instead of having like eight or ten counselors it had 40 counselors for no reason well i think that they lost sight of why these kinds of movies are appealing and they're appealing because of the suspense and because of the surprises and the gore and those types of things and there wasn't enough of that and there was too much other story that they were trying to jam in relationships between these characters and i'm like i love a, I, I love a good backstory uh, uh, if you can give me a whole bunch of backstories randomly on people in a movie i love it but not in a slasher film that's not where this belongs yeah and the, the relationships are so mishandled that it's like okay so these people are a couple these people are a couple and these people are a couple but they'll also just pair off with literally anyone who's mm -hmm. around and nobody cares and we're supposed to believe that like mitchy and Elena have like this extremely close bond, but they just like split up and do completely random things the whole time. They yeah. they hardly ever hang out with each other at this whole party. Yeah. And thinking back on the film, I'm trying to remember like a good solid kill. Like, I mean, there were kills. I just can't. My favorite kill is the, is the killer dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coming out of the train. I, I think that's the most memorable one in the film. But when you think back to something like Friday the 13th, you you know, you think about the arrow coming through Kevin Bacon. You think about the person hanging off the back of the door. You think about the decapitation. Like, you think about all of these shots that are iconic because the, of the kills. Almost and, all these kills happen off screen. Yeah, none of these are impressive in that way. And so, yeah. like, I think they're really missing out on all of the things that make slasher films really appealing. And the Mo one is especially disappointing because you're just like, 
I thought I was supposed to be following this character. I thought this was like going to be at the very guy. least yeah. one of the last two that survives, yeah. and he just dies in between shots yeah. somehow. Some, somehow, because when when they open up his shirt, it's a pretty big wound. Here's the thing, though. I think that death is actually more explainable than some of the other ones, because I think when he goes to do the magic trick where he's turning into his assistant, like the assistant is probably like sitting there right next to mo stabbing him to death Mm -hmm. on the floor and then she stands to replace copperfield behind the blanket and that's that's how they did that trick it's like oh i was murdering someone right over there and now i'm here because they're literally feet apart and why kill a magician why kill your alibi i don't know yeah he didn't seem to deserve it i guess we just had to story wise we just had to rule him out for you know for for us to know that he wasn't it, we had to kill him, I guess. But I don't know why the motivation of our killer to kill him. Yeah, that seems strange. There was plans at some point for a potential sequel. They were going to have like him rise up from the water. If I assume they would use the different take of the landing mm-hmm. um, if they wanted Kenny to survive this fall. Terror pontoon. Yeah. <laughs> What? <laughs> Please be terror plane. Yeah. Where this is all happening on an airplane. But I think what I would have wanted would be for like uh like after everybody gets off the train, like you just like the camera floats through the snow back to that river and then suddenly David Copperfield just floats out of the water and goes, Ta da <laughs> It's like what? Huh? It doesn't matter. Magic. <laughs> that was like when uh you you liked my alternate line when she's like, Oh, do you know how he does this? And he's like, Yeah and she's like, How's he do it? And then magic. I wanted her to just say magic. <laughs> That's what I thought he was going to say. It's like I can't reveal it. No, magic. Magic was He's the answer. He's using real magic. <laughs> that was the funny answer. And like I said, like they keep building up the, the conductor to be this possible magician. Yeah. And so I really wanted some kind of crazy yeah. like trick Sol- that he does. Yeah. Sol- solve this mystery and mm-hmm. save the lives of these people on the train by, by, with magic. That yeah. would have been great. And he even tries to do a magic trick, like, for practice with one of the other train employees. And the guy's like, no, 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 I religion. I can't touch cards. Yeah. He's like, okay, great. <laughs> Guess we never get to More see More details for these characters. <laughs> Unnecessary. We didn't need to hear a single staff member of this train say a word. I would have been happy with just all aboard. He yeah. shouldn't have said anything else in this movie. Yeah. Speaking of which, there were too many staff members in addition to too many party guests. Like, we if had you, too if, many random people searching the train. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you count the magician and the assistant as employees of the train, which I feel like they're included in the experience, there are like seven staff members. Mm-hmm. And by the end of the movie, five of them are dead. <laughs> they make up half of the victims. Because I'm assuming he, he also killed one the other conductor. The one that he took the place of. The engineer? Well, because he, he killed the two engineers, shovels and, and, and... He killed the two engineers, one of the two porters. Yeah, and but then when Jimmy Lee comes up crying, there's a guy in a conductor's outfit. Because there's was, there was the conductor and the and the brakeman. Right. right. And the brakeman is dead because uh, he's wearing the brakeman's hat at Correct. the end when she finds so, him. So he must be dead. Yeah. Because yeah. then the conductor, Carney... Okay. So a lot of people die that weren't involved in this murder. That mm-hmm. really bothers me. That bothers me more now when I thought it was just one. Now it's now I realize it's a whole bunch of people. And I'm like, what is the logic of this killer? That, you know, if you're going to yeah, have a backstory, follow it. Yeah, at least four or five of the ten it. people that die. Like, nine people die at the killer's hands in this movie. And five of them were train employees that had nothing <laughs> to do with this prank. Or, or, or just, if you're going to kill the engineers, then have the train speed up so it's going to derail and kill everybody. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Like, that should be the threat, is that no one knows how to stop the train because the engineers are dead. Yeah. Yeah. Our director here was Roger Spottiswood. Like I said before, he was an editor for Peckinpah Films, Straw Dogs, and Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. He also worked in the editorial department of Peckinpah's The Getaway. He directs Pursuit of D.B. Cooper for us next year. He also directed Turner and Hooch, Air America, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Tomorrow Never Dies, and The Sixth Day. So he got better. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if the sixth day is better. I, did, I was I more referring to some day. of the other ones. <laughs> it's better than this. Uh, he also wrote both uh, 48 Hours and another 48 Hours. Writer T.Y. Drake has mostly TV before and after this. He's half of the screenwriting credit Tom and Sally Drake from MacGyver's original series episode, The 10% Solution, oh. which sadly came true. Yeah, that's a <laughs> chilling episode. 
uh ep and story from daniel grodnick he was a co-producer on without warning earlier this year he's also a producer on christmas vacation and powder judith rasco also wrote next year's endless love starring brooke shields and directed by franco zeffirelli cinematographer john alcott known for his collabs with kubrick on 2001 clockwork barry linden and the shining and then jumped over to this yeah directly from the shining um Weird. it sounds neat though the way they did the lighting for the set where they had lights set up on dimmers outside the train windows mm-hmm. so they could bring it up or down to whatever level they needed and they were using like like pen lights to light actors faces in dimly lit corridors and stuff like that mm-hmm. it was interesting uh we'll see his work next in fort apache the bronx next year uh he also does the cinematography for Beastmaster graystoke the legend of tarzan lord of the apes and no way out he suffered a fatal heart attack in Cannes in 1986 and in his memory the british society of cinematographers created the bsc john alcott ari award to honor fellow lighting cameramen in film ben johnson was karn that was our conductor oh, i don't think anyone calls him karn in the whole movie he has the best supporting actor oscar for his role in the last picture show He's also Tector Gorch in The Wild Bunch, Jack Benyon in The Getaway, where he met and befriended Roger Spottiswood, the director of this film, and he's Mr. Mason in Red Dawn. So is he supposed to be Karn as in, like, Carney? Like, is that another bit of backstory for this dude, that he used to be a Carney who did magic? It's C-A-R-N-E is how his name is spelled. Mm -hmm. I think it's just his name. Okay. They probably just drove past, like, a Karn RV billboard while they were writing the movie in a car. Or Carne Asada maybe hey, that's what i have for lunch let's name a character after every that. character is going to be named out what else what's good here well i like the elena burger <laughs> <clears throat> um we had him earlier this year in the hunter as sheriff strong i think that's the guy who pulls a gun on uh steve mcqueen in steve his McQueen. office yeah and he's just like just like okay see you later <laughs> he yep. turns around and walks out <laughs> Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was Elena. She's obviously the daughter of Janet Lee and Tony Curtis. She's Laurie Strode, the linchpin of the Halloween franchise. She was already designated a Scream Queen by the start of this production, despite only a few titles to her resume. She was also in A Fish Called Wanda, the Freaky Friday reboot, True Lies. She's uh, the mom in the My Girl movies. She appeared appropriately on the series Scream Queens as uh, Dean Kathy Munch. She was also Joan Day, mother of Jessica Day, played by Zoe Deschanel on The New Girl. She also appeared in Ryan Johnson's Knives Out as Linda Drysdale, daughter of Harlan Thrombey, as played by Christopher Plummer from our previous film. We'll see her next year with Stacey Keach in Road Games. Hart Bachner played Doc. He's Ethan in Supergirl from the director of our previous film, Somewhere in Time. He's also Rod in Breaking Away. He's Ellis the Asshole in Die Hard, and he's the voice of Arthur Reeves' corrupt Gotham City official in Batman Mask of the Phantasm. We'll see him next year as Chris Adams in Rich and Famous, and he also directed a couple of funny school movies, namely Comedy Central staple PCU with Jeremy Piven, John Favreau, David Spade, George Clinton, and the Parliament Funkadelic, and High School High with John Lovitz and Tia Carrera. David Copperfield played the magician. He's a world-famous magician who appears only as himself moving forward in films like Now You See Me and the illogically titled Now You See Me Too. <laughs> <laughs> he also appears in the incredible Burt they, Wonderstone. Wait, how did they spell the two in that it's one? It's just the number two. Okay, just making sure it wasn't T-O-O. <laughs> it's still dumb. It's obvious why they should have called it, and they didn't. Well, uh, Dan Harmon has a whole bit about that, about with the actual movie's now you see me and i hate those movies yeah (laughs) they make they're so infuriating yeah they're terrible uh he also appears in the incredible burt wonderstone as well as episodes of scrubs and the simpsons his television specials have won 21 emmys he has a french knighthood and he holds 11 guinness world records though they mostly involve just being impressively rich (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i.e. the largest collection of magic artifacts or the most expensive poster depicting magic sold at auction his most famous illusions have included the disappearance of a learjet the vanishing and reappearance of the statue of liberty 
levitating over the Grand Canyon, walking through the Great Wall of China, escaping from Alcatraz prison, the disappearance of an Orient Express dining car, and flying on stage for several minutes. That's the one I think I'd want to see the most. Him literally just flying on stage. That sounds pretty impressive. Derek McKinnon played Kenny. Not much else here. Uh, according to the director, uh, Kenny was basically just a, a transvestite from the streets of Montreal that they found someone who could convincibly portray a woman for enough of this movie. How many how many transvestite killers are we going to have this year? Yeah. Uh, all of them. <laughs> yeah, and, and I was going to say, I was going to bring up uh, Dress to Kill. Yeah. Uh, it was like, I wish they would have convincingly done that. Yeah, that would have been great. <laughs> No offense, Michael Caine, but you don't pass as a woman. Yeah. Uh, Sandy Curie played Mitchie. This was her first feature. She'll be back for Gas next year. She plays Tara DeMilo in Curtains. She passed away fairly young in 1996 from toxic shock syndrome, which I believe is what killed Jim Henson. Not, as far as I can tell, related to Cherry or Sandra Curry, who we've had so far this year in Foxes and Last Married Couple in America, respectively. Timothy Weber was Mo. He'll be back next year in Ticket to Heaven. He plays Sergeant Fernie in The Gray Fox with Richard Farnsworth, which is getting a beautiful new Blu-ray from Kino Lorber soon. It's probably out by now. He also played Joe Banneker in MacGyver episode Deep Cover, where he sells submarines to drug smugglers or something like yeah. that. More recently, he has made appearances as Ape Elder in War for the Planet of the Apes and The Apprentice on ABC's Once Upon a Time. Anthony Sherwood played Jackson. He was Jason Locke on Airwolf. He's also Hilton Overstreet in Eddie and the Cruisers 2. Eddie lives! Exclamation mark. Vanity played Mary as Dee Dee Winters. Her credit here is Dee Dee Winters. Uh, she's Laura Charles in The Last Dragon. She yeah. plays Dory. And what is The Last Dragon? Oh, The Last Dragon is fantastic. You guys would love it. Um, what year is that? Oh, it has to be 86. Okay, so 85. Is that the, so 85. That's a Sean Connery one? No, no. that's Dragon Heart. <laughs> that's what I think of when I hear The Last Dragon. I am the last one. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, last Dragon is about uh, an African American uh, martial artist. People call him Bruce Leroy. Okay. And uh, he's just uh, dealing with like people on the streets. It's it's a lot like um, the Jackie Chan movie. The uh, crap. What was the Jackie Chan movie we watched? Oh, the, the big brawl, Battle Creek the big brawl. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of like that where he like his family doesn't want him doing it, but you know he he tries to to be honorable about it, but he has to go through all this crazy street fighting stuff. There's supernatural stuff. There's '80s music videos. Uh, uh, yeah, Vanity plays the damsel in distress. It's yeah, really great. All right, well, I'm excited for that one now. Uh, she's also Doreen in Fifty Two Pickup. She's also Sydney Ash in Action Jackson, and she's the lead singer of female trio group vanity six who had a fairly big hit with 1982's nasty girl she and co-star jamie lee curtis were both at different times romantically linked to adam ant andrea kenyon played bunny girl she is now a casting director for titles like warm bodies riddick x-men days of future past nine lives x-men dark phoenix and roland emmerich's pearl harbor midway that just came out um i think for this one I have to go down. I don't think this is worth watching. I don't think there's anything great here. Yeah, I, I really wanted to like it a lot, but it it didn't really have the hallmarks of a good slasher film for me. And so I, I think I agree that it's a down. If there were, if there was even one really cool kill, but there's not one that I can point to. Right, that's what I'm saying. It, it's, it's missing out on a lot of the things that I think make the slasher film great, which is disappointing because... I think the original concept of trying to take a film like Halloween and put it on a train is interesting. Yeah. But I, I, I just think that they, they kind of missed, they, they missed taking the opportunities that were the most interesting. I, I would like to see this movie remade now in more capable hands and with like an insane makeup budget so that this yeah. person could be really transforming from person to person. Mm-hmm. And, but, and also modern train cars are a little bit easier to, because they have multiple floors now? I would still want it to be a retro train car. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, you could build them so that you could put the camera wherever you want it. But I, I think I think it's fun to have it be a retro train car and make it feel yeah. a little bit old-fashioned. But but it makes it difficult to 
to move because these but that but that's some of the appeal of it to be like you're being chased by somebody and you're trying to hide in a place where there's not a lot of room to run and there's not a lot of places to hide right but also the logic of having to get from the first train car to the fifth train car without anyone noticing you yeah you just spider walk underneath the train there you go yeah, but there's, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, to, to do interesting things of people climbing on the outsides of trains and, uh, you know, chasing down narrow corridors. And I don't think we took advantage of any of that. Yeah. Up or down, Richard? Oh, is it down? <laughs> uh, I don't like horror films. I don't like slasher films. And I especially didn't like this one. Uh, I love Jamie Lee Curtis, but that's about as far as it went for me yeah and i like ben johnson too but he didn't need to be in this no and uh, jamie lee curtis you know whatever she just wrapped prom night she's she had a slot for a third movie this year and this came up and it was right down the street so she went and did it and i don't care it was a very quick shoot and it sounds like she was treated very professionally you know it it wasn't a, a trauma for her so whatever be in a be in a bad movie and get a paycheck on the way to next year with road games with stacy keach which looks like a fun one from the trailer Mm -hmm. and then halloween 2 next year which is at least with carpenter yeah so she's back to her roots yeah um but she already done the fog so she got the like critical appraise that she wants and then prom night was yeah prom night's better than this though yeah Um, yeah Richard, where's this going on your letterbox? Uh, I have this very low. I have this at 111. Oof. Okay, out of 125. Uh, this, this puts it below the octagon and right above He Knows You're Alone. Okay, that makes sense to me. Although He Knows You're Alone has like some pretty cool kills in it, like mm-hmm. the head in the fish tank and stuff like that. But otherwise, they're they're very similar movies. Yeah. They have one really charismatic actor who yeah. doesn't get to do enough. and And just a lot of just nonsensical like wasting of time yeah and also the logistical problems of wait how is this person getting around to all these places yeah for me this is going in 77th place uh which is right under hangar 18 and right above death ship the other sandy howard harold greenberg movie for the year so they're turning out consistent product at least um even if it's consistently garbage um <laughs> But that's where I have these. Jess, where's this going, Letterboxd? Uh, I'm going to put it at 84th. It's below How to Be the High Cost of Living, but above Don't Answer the Phone. I did not expect to have this the highest of the three of us. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I had it a little higher, but it's just it, it, it's just missing a lot for me. Yeah. But I do enjoy it conceptually better than something like Don't Answer the Phone. So yeah. I, I, I put it above that. And... um. Uh, similarly um it is just a few above to all good night uh just because again like i I like the ideas better than what the ideas that were happening in those yeah this i have it four above to all a good night even though to all a good night has better kills and a story that makes some sense i think it's just less professionally done yeah there you go and it has jamie lee curtis whereas all all to all a good night has going for it is jennifer runyon which i love jennifer runyon but she's not jamie lee curtis in terms of value to the production yeah um i think that's everything we have for this one if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share we are vintage video pod on twitter facebook instagram and letterbox whereas i've said before you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year we can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com please consider rating us on itunes to help people find the show and if you take the time to leave us a review we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode if you're feeling especially generous you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintage video podcast Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Kage Musha, which IMDb describes like so. A petty thief with an utter resemblance to a samurai warlord is hired as the lord's double. When the warlord later dies, the thief is forced to take up arms in his place. We leave you now with the trailer for Kage Musha.
a new film by Akira Kurosawa, director of two Academy Award winners, Kagemusha, The Shadow Warrior, 